World Economic Forum is taking place this week in Davos. And with nearly 2,500 global leaders from a variety of companies gathering, there's certainly no shortage of conversation, especially those surrounding the labor markets. Let's send it out to Yahoo Finance Editor-in-Chief Andy Serwer, who is with us with a special guest. Yeah, thanks very much, Jared. I'm here with Kathy Bloomgarden, CEO of Reuter Fin. Kathy, nice to see you. Andy, it's so great to see you too after many months of uh, no Davos. So it's great to be here in person. And some sunny, warm weather for <laughs> once. Um, so I want to talk to you about what you're up to, Kathy. You're super, super busy. Crisis management is something you do, advising companies on communications. No shortage of work there, I'm sure. And you've spoken recently about leading with empathy, mm -hmm. listening to employees. I wonder what that means in practical terms when you think of a situation like, let's say, Walt Disney and what they've gone through and stumbled uh, into in Florida. Yeah, well, thanks for the question, Andy. Yes, many people are facing the same kind of dilemma and challenge. And what's really important first, of course, is to recognize that corporate reputation has an impact on your stock price, on your employees, on the communities where you operate. You know, it's really very pervasive and needs to be front and center. And what's happened is there's been a shift. Um, and we were experiencing, we're living at a time when people expect something different from leadership. Leadership is important. Um, people look to leadership. And what they want is an authentic, caring, new, empathetic kind of leadership model. That's a real change. This is a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift from where we've been. And it's representative of both a polarized society that we live in, um, where there's really equal emotional tensions uh, on both sides. And it's also representative of a generational shift. So young people, they want values, they want a caring culture, they want a leadership that's very empathetic. So we really have a new paradigm that we're facing in the in, today. And part of that is speed and social media, yes. Kathy. So I want to ask you about that. How yeah. does a CEO respond, know when to respond, how quickly, and then on Twitter, on Facebook, etc. Absolutely. Well, the first point is that we real you have very little time to respond. So we really recommend that everybody get a decision model in place, meaning what is important to you when you make the decision of t speaking up or not speaking up? Is it related to your business? Do your employees care intensely about it? Has it? Does it have a huge impact on society? All of these are variables that every company has to put into a model that they actually create that's resonant with their own company. And you have very little time. And you shouldn't respond in ways that will actually increase the hostility and the, and the viral con potential of, of a dialogue or a dispute. There's a, a phenomenon called conversation decay, which means that conversations actually die down very quickly many, many times times. So we need to predict which debates, which dialogues are, have the potential to really mushroom up. And those are the ones where your employees and the community will expect for you to, to speak up, but not in every situation. So the important thing to remember is that this new leadership style requires a sensitivity to issues, a sensitivity more to listening than in the past, um, but not that you're jumping on every issue um, that comes your way. So a senior VP at XYZ company <laughs> starts to put something out on Twitter. They write that they're the senior VP at this company. Are they free to say whatever they want about their company or competitors? Um, actually, if you're speaking and you're affiliated with the company, then whatever you say is going to represent the company's point of view. So you do have a, a responsibility um, to be representing the company to your key stakeholders. Have you ever given any thought, Kathy, to representing, maybe you already do, Elon Musk? <laughs> what do you think about his style of communication? Well, I think that people pay attention to Elon Musk, and I think that he has really blazed some new trails. So whether he succeeds or not will ultimately be the answer to your question. But no one has, doesn't listen to what he's saying, and uh, he truly makes a splash. On a more serious note, when it comes to Russia and how companies have responded, uh, shareholders and employees and uh, government officials have, in some senses, demanded that companies retreat from that country. 
Is that easier said than done in some instances? Yeah, it's actually quite difficult. Um, you want to make sure that you are fulfilling your mission of your company at the same time that you're actually fulfilling your values. And you have to actually take a decision, as I said earlier, that's in line with a complex of variables that actually comprise how you how fast you move, the decisions you make, um, and in this case, of course, a moral, moral imperative. And final question, Kathy, is it really the case that young people are that different today, or is it just the case that young people are always more idealistic? Well, probably a mix of the two, but I think the younger generation um, is looking for something different in their careers. Um, they're looking for choice. Um, they want to be independent. Many more of them want to go and, and start a, a, an, an enterprise rather than work for a multinational. They're not, you know, really driven by salary. Um, so we really do have a new generational um, set of priorities that we have to pay attention to in Gen Z. Right, and they're also technologically native as well, so that's Absolutely. Different. Kathy Bloomgarden, <laughs> CEO of Ruderfin, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Andy. Our next guest says China's economic slowdown could be the single largest factor in creating a global recession. Let's bring in Josh Lipsky. He is the director of the Atlantic Council Geoeconomics Center. And Josh, you know, I mean, Brian pointed to what he has heard from in some of his interviews, but we heard the managing director of the IMF say the global economy faces the biggest test since World War II today to kick off Davos. I mean, how much of this do you think is largely going to be driven by China? Well, a lot's going to be driven by China. And thanks for having me, Kiko and Brian. But, you know, we have to take a step back. I know this is the first summer session of Davos in a long time, but from a macroeconomic perspective, this is an extraordinarily gloomy outlook. So slow growth in China, and we can talk about that. Soaring inflation, and now these numbers out of the US, which raise fears of a recession. Food shortages around the world. The risk of emerging market defaults. So all of this at the same time, slow down in Eurozone, US and China, those three anchors of the global economy. We haven't seen a situation like that. So the confluence of an events and Kristalina Dordieva, the head of the IMF, said confluence of calamities, that in and of itself should give everyone a lot of pause entering into this Davos. And I know that, you know, we look back at Davos the last time they all convened in person, January 2020, right? Right behind the curve before what we're about to see with the pandemic. Let's hope we're not in for a repeat this time. But a lot of the economic stresses we thought were going to happen at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of debt default and economic distress were put off because of fiscal and monetary stimulus. We don't have that now. And now we're dealing with the realities economically we thought we'd be facing two years ago. And also, Josh, you know, when you think about Davos, this has typically been a gathering of world leaders, business leaders to really push for this idea of globalization. And yet increasingly over the last year, and even more so this year, we have seen what some would call a type of decoupling that's happening, onshoring more and more, sticking to what the Biden administration has, has called those with similar values. I mean, how much of that do you think tests this idea of a concerted effort to keep the economic recovery going globally? Well, you know, it's ironic that the term of the week in Davos is going to be deglobalization. Imagine saying that two years ago, but that's what these business leaders are talking about on the promenade and in the after parties. What does friend shoring mean, as Secretary Yellen has talked about? How is that different than ally shoring? What about regional trade arrangements and plurilateral trade arrangements? This is a very different Davos than a few years ago. And the question is, how much is that going to happen in the next few years over the next decade? What transitions out of China? As usual, there's a lot more talk than action, but we look at, you know, what happening in Vietnam, for example, in terms of supply chain. So there will be winners in this reorientation. They will not happen overnight. And the question for business leaders at Davos is who will be the winners and who will be the losers? But we are entering a different period of the global economic environment than we've been in over the past 20 years. And Davos has to recognize that. 
Hey, Josh, Brian Chung here. I mean, more talk than action seems to describe most of Davos of years past. But uh, all of this is kind of thematic to the news that we're getting out of Asia with President Biden making a push for that Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF. Uh, that's very much thematic to in a, what could be an alliance against China, especially as some of that friendshoring perhaps incentivizes companies to go elsewhere. What do you see as the big difference between that IPEF and the TPP, the Trans-Pacific yeah. Partnership, that people were talking about not so long ago? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I mean, we should be upfront and say IPEF is not a traditional trade deal because it doesn't offer market access, right? So this is very different than TPP or its successor once the US withdrew, CPTPP. That being said, it's good to see the US engaging in trade and economic and regional integration. And they have every major economy you would want signed on to it, at least at the outset, 40% of global GDP. You have Singapore there, you have Malaysia there, you have Vietnam there. So that's a success for this administration, but devil is in the details, right? They've just just announced the framework, cooperation on issues like climate and technology and early warning on supply chain, all good. But when we push comes to shove, when these countries maybe need to choose between an increased RCEP deal with China or China involved in CPTPP, and will that force a difference between this framework? This framework doesn't offer as much economically at this point as those deals do. We'll see if that continues in the months ahead. Well, I mean, that is the key question, because the U.S., after withdrawing from TPP under President Trump, I mean, some would argue in Asia, they've largely been absent on those trade talks. And so how effective can a framework like this be when it doesn't really offer the very thing you mentioned, the, the number one thing these economies want, which is market access into the U.S.? Well, it can only be effective as the beginning of something, not the end of something. So if it can be a signal from the US that they wanna re-engage in the region economically through a coordinated trade mechanism, then that's a positive. But if in two, three years, four years time, we don't see anything more than this framework outlines now, then that won't be a success. So I think a lot of reasons countries have signed on is because they hope over time, and you actually heard this out of Singapore today, that the US political situation changes and this can become a larger trade deal. Whether that happens or not will be the true test of IPF over time. Uh, and Josh, lastly here, I want to ask just kind of big picture here, because if we kind of smash the two themes that we were talking about with, uh, you know, concerns about Chinese growth and the spillover effects, but also this friend shoring impact of people trying to stake sides here, does that mean that this kind of deglobalization process is going to have to come with slower global growth as the world's second largest economy perhaps gets isolated? Yeah, I mean, let's just step back and think about this. You know, no one really agrees what it means to have a global recession. Economists debate this. It's different than a domestic economic recession, two quarters of negative GDP growth. But let's say your baseline is 2% GDP growth as a global recession. We've had four of those in the last 40 years. In each of those, China's been growing around 8%. That won't be the case if we get into this global economic recession scenario in 2023. They'll be glowing at 3%, maybe 4%. So think of what that means if you have recession in the US, recession in the Eurozone, and now recession in China, the world's second largest economy. It's a very different dynamic and your friend shoring, your reshoring looks very different in that scenario. And this is where you look at emerging Asia, which is why I think what we're talking about on the trade side is so important. It's a different kind of recession and then a different kind of recovery on the back end. Josh Lipsky, Atlantic Council Geoeconomic Center Director. Thanks so much for taking the time. The World Economic Forum has officially kicked off and Grayscale CEO Mike Sonnenschein is weighing in on the state of the crypto market. Take a listen. Well, I think we have to examine crypto in the context of what's been happening in the broader markets, right? You've seen rising rates in the U.S. has caused a lot of volatility in a lot of different asset classes, crypto along with it. The recent sell-off, though, from what we're hearing from investors has not deterred them. If anything, they're looking at it opportunistically, and a pullback like this is nothing new in the crypto space. What's your take on how aligned crypto is to other financial assets? There's a lot of controversy there. Is it a hedge? Does it go in the same direction or not? 
Our standpoint on this is largely when you're looking at something like Bitcoin, you're looking at something that for us really does look, feel, and act like a digital gold. If you look out over a longer time horizon, you will see crypto being uncorrelated to other asset classes. Although oftentimes, to your point, it is scrutinized because we do only have the last 10 plus years of trading history to really examine. Correlation, that was the word I was looking for. So uh, just a couple of other hiccups this year regarding Terra and Luna. And I, I'm wondering what your uh, opinion is there. Well, the recent Terra event, as everyone knows, really allowed a lot of investors to evaluate the stablecoin ecosystem as a whole. This is a very important component of keeping liquidity in the crypto space, but avoiding having to go back to the traditional financial system. When you have an event like this, though, investors take a step back. They're examining other stable coins like USDC and others, and really just ensuring that they're operating as they're intended to do so. I find, in, and I've been in the crypto space, as you know, over the last eight years, we do see a lot of one-off events like this. And what you do see on the other side of them is that the crypto ecosystem is very resilient. Lessons are learned and we keep building and we actually come out stronger. With regard to BTC, you mentioned store of value. Has your thinking changed between store of value and currency um, and the, the use case for uh, Bitcoin? It honestly hasn't. We also have to, again, remember we're only 10, 12 years into the life cycle of Bitcoin. And when you think about how much it's developed over this last decade plus, a lot of people criticize it for not becoming an overall currency to go buy a cappuccino, to pay your rent, things like that. But if Bitcoin is successful, and it largely is very successful already, it, there's nothing wrong with its solo use case being as a digital gold, a gold 2.0, a gold for a new and younger generation. Right, some of those people are saying like this is uh, crypto is a solution in search of a problem. I don't agree with that necessarily. I right. think that Bitcoin represents and, and the crypto ecosystem as a whole creates a more equitable, more inclusive financial system. That's certainly a very large topic here at Davos this year. And I know that we and a lot of others are excited to dive into it. Where do things stand with trying to get an ETF approved by the SEC, Michael? Well, the Grayscale team has been putting the full resources of the firm behind getting our you know, largest fund, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, ticker GBTC, converted to an ETF. Now, this has been something that we as an organization have been working on for at least the last six plus years. Ultimately, this is an investor protection issue. There are over 800,000 accounts in the U.S. alone, all 50 states represented, that own shares of GBTC. And so when we're working proactively with regulators to have them bring the ETF, to bring it closer into the regulatory perimeter, to give investors additional protections, additional disclosure, we think that we, and hopefully the SEC, is going to do the right thing here and approve the ETF because investors have been patient and, quite frankly, they deserve a spot ETF. And final question, Michael, with regard to regulation overall, are you sanguine about the pace of change there? We're spending a lot of time in D.C., and that's also a reason that the Grayscale team is here at Davos. Regulation around crypto and the entire ecosystem is paramount. One thing that we really would like to see is, you know, certainly on the heels of the White House executive order, what you've seen out of the U.K. government, what you've seen in Germany recently, a lot of governments are moving their policies and procedures forward, and we'd like the U.S. to do the same thing here. We need to see regulation beyond just enforcement so that we have the proper regulatory frameworks to foster the innovation, to create job growth, to create products and services, to ensure that the innovation around this technology remains in the U.S. and we don't lose our competitive advantage there. A schedule change makes for a very different backdrop for Davos this year as the usual snow-capped mountains are anything but. Climate change, though, is the primary focus, and that puts former Secretary of State John Kerry at the center of the conversation. The Secretary spoke with our Editor-in-Chief Andy Serwer about their agenda. Well, we are talking to the folks about new initiatives. We, we created a number of months ago an entity called the First Mover Coalition. And we have major, we had 35 major corporations from around the world who have decided to be leaders in creating a demand signal by opening up markets more rapidly through making their own commitments, 
to make purchases or to behave in a certain way. For instance, Maersk Shipping, larger container shipper in the world, has agreed the next eight ships they build are going to be carbon free. Volvo and others have decided to step up and say 10% of the steel they buy is going to be green steel. You have major airlines, United, uh, Delta, uh, Boeing, uh, and Salesforce and Apple have all agreed that whatever flying operations those particular companies engage in, they will buy 5% sustainable aviation fuel, 85% reduction in emissions. So there are a whole lot of things like that, that individual companies, banks, major financial institutions and others, and we'll have some important announcements about the new things that they're going to be doing and in new sectors. That's a lot of stuff with a lot of big name companies, Mr. Secretary. Do you personally get involved in the discussions with them about doing these types of things? Absolutely. And we had <clears throat> we have a terrific team of people. We're doing this in cooperation with the World Economic Forum. <clears throat> we announced it uh, last year, actually. Been working on it for some period of time. But but these chief executives, these, these CEOs really deserve the credit. They're stepping up. They understand the urgency. And they've decided they're going to be leaders in helping to send the demand signals necessary to change behavior. So we've got folks working in, you know, on, on, uh, uh, on uh, aluminum and shipping and steel and concrete. And, you know, it's major. These have been the hard to do things. But we're moving into that sector and getting things done. Shifting gears a little bit here, obviously, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is front and center. And uh, I want to ask you how that's impacting uh, climate, because there's a lot of talk about Europeans turning to coal as a stopgap measure in lieu of Russian gas. What's your take on that? Well, coal is the dirtiest fuel there is, no matter what. If it's unabated, and most of it is not mitigated or abated. So that's a problem, but they're not, uh, you know, Europe's big lesson out of this is that they want to be energy independent. And they're going to move far more rapidly to get off of Russian gas, to separate themselves, and to deploy the renewable base of their uh, of their grid so that they can be free from the emissions and from petro dictators who weaponize energy. So I think in, in, at, the, at the end product, it could be very salutary, but you've got to avoid building out major long-term infrastructure that doesn't mitigate, that doesn't capture emissions and, and, and deal with the problem of the climate crisis. So you can't allow Ukraine to, to become an excuse for people to do things they wanted to do anyway, which is continue to simply produce the way they've been producing, and that's what we've got to avoid. Is nuclear part of that equation uh, for you in terms of being able to shift away from, um, to, away from oil and gas? The answer is, for President Biden, absolutely. He has kept nuclear on the table. It's a very important ingredient. Bill Gates is building a new design of a nuclear plant in Wyoming now uh, and has put his own money into that effort together with some federal money. Uh, there's another nuclear plant being explored in a built out uh, demonstration in Idaho at the National Laboratory. Uh, MIT is doing work on small container sized uh, nuclear battery. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of research effort. And, and, and France is doubling down on nuclear. UK is looking at nuclear. A lot of other countries have decided that they just can't get to net zero 2050 without the use of a zero emissions current technology capacity. And so, yes, nuclear will be part of that mix. As a former Secretary of State and now the envoy for climate, this type of environment seems to match both of your experiences or skill sets. Is it sort of unique in that sense? Well, I'm not sure what, what you exactly mean by that. Um, well, in that, in that geopolitics and energy seem to be mixed and well, they always have been. in a way. No, they always have been. Okay. It's just, uh, it has been without the focus that exists today on the climate crisis, which comes from emissions. Right. I mean, you know, this is not complicated. It's basic mathematics and physics. 
you know, certain things are happening because human beings are choosing to provide for their power or their transportation by combustion, by burning fossil fuel. And if you don't lower the emissions, those emissions create a blanket which warms, you know, goes up in the atmosphere, warms the planet. And there isn't anybody I know today who doesn't l admit that the planet is warming and that uh, life has changed as a result of this. If we want to stop spending literally hundreds of billions of dollars, and over a long period of time we've spent trillions of dollars just cleaning up after worse storms every year, after floods, after fires, after drought, after, I mean, you know, at some point, uh, human nature has traditionally proven pretty apt at discerning a trend. <laughs> and this trend is pretty obvious. Uh, the climate crisis is getting worse, not better. And we have to much more rapidly be reducing emissions and taking the steps, not that politicians are saying we should do, but that scientists whose lives are dedicated to determining the mathematics and the physics of this particular challenge. And most business leaders seem to be on board as well at this point. It's unbelievable what's happening. The private sector is really moving. And yes, there's a gigantic uh, shift with the private sector taking the lead in many places, and that's all kinds of private sector institutions. Uh, and, and by the way, some fossil fuel companies are now working very hard to become energy companies and transition to producing electricity and doing it in a clean way, either through hydrogen or nuclear or in other ways. So this, this is not something that leaves the world without options that work for our economy. In fact, this is perhaps one of the greatest economic opportunities we've ever faced. Uh, not, you know, it, it potentially much larger than the Industrial Revolution because we have to build out new energy grids. We're building out now new vehicles. Ford mm -hmm. Motor Company and General Motors have both said they're going to have only electric vehicles by 2035. So those companies are moving because the marketplace is moving and they know we have to do that. Yeah, I was going to ask, you hadn't mentioned EVs, but uh, it's, is that something in your purview as well? Do you talk to Tesla and Elon Musk, and do you talk to people in Detroit about that? Well, I talk to them about the overall uh, impact, but by and large, that falls into the domestic hat, which Gina McCarthy and her team have been working on, and they've done a terrific job. I mean, these companies have made their own decisions, though. Uh, they're, they, you know, they're led by thoughtful, visionary folks who are looking down the road, and they recognize that if we are going to meet our goals with respect to climate, we have to have it all, you know, everything has to be part of the solution. Agriculture, shipping, buildings, transportation, right. manufacturing, we all have to look at the ways we can reduce the emissions, which by the way, are pollution. And 15 million people die every year because of the impacts of that pollution in the atmosphere. So, you know, the common sense thing to do is what we began to do years ago, clean up the air, right. not allow pollution to be dominating the impacts on our lives. And, and so we have to get back to that. And there's a lot of money to be made in producing the goods, in defining the new technologies, bringing them to market, bringing them to scale. And that's what a lot of venture capitalists and investment uh, entities are now realizing. And they're moving there. The market is moving and will move in this direction. <clears throat> we will get to, I'm absolutely convinced, we will get to a low carbon, no carbon economy at some point in time. The challenge is, will we get there in time to heed the warnings of the scientists and avoid the worst consequences of the crisis? Return to work was a topic of conversation at Davos, as you might imagine. From Yahoo Finance's Brian Zazie spoke to Slack CEO and co-founder Stuart Butterfield, who said the office will never be the same. What we'd love to see is, um, you know, kind of a, a different use for that square footage and really a purpose for people coming into the office. You know, rather than it's, you know, it's Tuesday at 8 a.m., so I guess I'm going to head to the office and then kind of mindlessly sleepwalk <laughs> through my day. Um, 
And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but we're taking a couple floors in our San Francisco headquarters and trying one configuration that's like larger spaces for like 30 to 60 people, one that's more like five to eight. And this will sound bizarre, maybe, but I was in Javits Center uh, in January and I was walking through it and I was like, we need this. Now, not necessarily the same style as, as Javits, but the kind of like, you know those slidey doors they Anything have in hotels? Anything you can do to help the layout of the Javits, please, all four, yeah. just please help it. Well, that flexibility in layout, the kind of catering services, the ability to kind of like accommodate different groups, different sizes, mm -hmm. um, because that's, it, it's still a fantastic way to build relationships, to establish trust, and not, all that stuff is really important, but it's not as important as we used to think to have like, you know, a thousand desks where people are sitting by themselves, using their laptop, not talking to anyone. So there really is no one box that's going to emerge. You know, we hear Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky, the office is over. Others are saying a hybrid model, but you really don't see it that way. No, I mean, and what's funny is, and this is very anecdotal, so this is not hard data, but in talking to customers where they've made a pretty hard line and, and said everyone has to come back now, they're getting about 40% of people in. And the people who say, do whatever you want, we're getting 10%. And if you're kind of closer to the middle, but lean one way or the other, you get about 20%. So it doesn't really make that much of a difference. And obviously it differs by age group and market and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but yeah, definitely, I don't think we're ever going back to the way that it was, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. This pains me to even bring this up, but I, I had a, a family member mention to me, they were getting rid of Slack. They recently told what? me that. They said they're now back in the office 100%. I know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard for me to even <laughs> mention that, you believe me. But is that what's happening? Are you seeing, what's retention look like on the platform as oh, this, it's, this, it's, this movement of people? Go, it's go. actually, um, if anything, improved over the last couple of years. I mean, I'm looking backwards, but I don't see that just because one of the interesting things to think about is like, here's a thought experiment. It's March 2020, and for some reason, we're in a parallel universe, and you can still travel for work, you can use the conference room, you can have business dinners, you can go to the office, but you can't use any software. So like every company just disintegrates, like ceases to exist in 24 hours. So obviously at some point in the last couple decades, we actually switch from a world where the digital infrastructure that supports productivity collaboration is actually more important than the, the physical, because you just, you can't swap them. So we'll see uh, how long that lasts for that family member. Uh, yes, I will, I'll tell you who it is uh, outside of this interview. But uh, you know, I'm sure you're talking to a lot of customers, you have a lot of things going on here at the World Economic Forum. What is your sense of where their businesses are. I know you're not an economist, I'm not one either, but are we near a recession, close to one? What do you see? I don't know if I have anything insightful to add on the recession point, but you know, uh, a reason for optimism, I think, is that people, executives are, are taking more seriously the opportunity we have. Whereas I feel like from, let's say the summer of, of 2020, there was this rolling 90 day window where people are like, well, okay, we'll just do whatever we're doing now. And then 90 days from now, it'll, it'll end. But now that we've done that for, for two years, uh, there's a realization that we're not. And with that comes opportunities to kind of reimagine how we work. And that, you know, that intentionality about going to the office is, is one thing, but um, you know, uh, and people in the audience know, there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people, maybe even tens of millions of people around the world whose job is something like, get some data, put it into Excel, make a graph, take a screenshot, paste it into PowerPoint, and email the PowerPoint to I people. I those people. Yeah, <laughs> it, and there's a lot of that kind of manual work, and it's very, you, know, you can't go around questioning things all the time, um, but this is a real opportunity to question the way that we work and see if we can make some fundamental improvements. And uh, whether we go into recession or not, I think we come out of this whole thing stronger. I remember talking to you, it may have been a year and a half ago or, or two years, and you outlined a couple features that we might see on work from home platforms, and all of them happened six months later. So hat tip to you. What's yeah. the next big feature on some of these platforms like yours? Well, I'll tell you uh, one that's out now and, and one that I'm excited about. So one, uh, we were mentioning this uh, with the, with the uh, producer and the team here before, but um, you upload a video clip into Slack. Because sometimes it's easier to you know, to have that full spectrum body language, inflection, the voice, to be able to uh, share your screen and narrate over it. Um, but on the receiving end, it can also be a lot better because you can have the transcript, you can scan through, go to a particular line, click on that those words and jump to that point in the video. You can speed people up, you can pause for a minute, and that's very different than a video call. So it takes some, some discipline and some change in, in how people work, but it is ultimately much more effective. The other one is, 
Uh, I think we're getting a little bit better at this now, but there's a long time where we have this hammer of 30-minute Zoom calls, and so all business problems look like 30-minute Zoom nails. Mm -hmm. um, and you have, I don't know, like, let's say six, seven, eight hours a day of like half-hour blocks of, of these calls, and there's no artifact left behind. And I was in a, uh, a meeting, this is maybe three weeks ago or so, a couple of days later, I wanted to see the Figma file that one of the people had shared, and I blew like half an hour trying to find it. And if we had a way to capture what went on in the meetings, you're just kind of like a little bit of a receipt, the files that were shared, uh, the chat that went back and forth. Um, if there are people taking meeting notes and have the meeting notes show up there, but even just, you know, Brian joined at this time, Stuart had joined at this time, the meeting lasted this long, would be a huge step forward. And I think um, we're working on a lot of ways to try to have some lasting value created out of those meetings and make it much, much easier for people to do that. Lastly, uh, you're a serial entrepreneur. Uh, you've created really awesome businesses. What's next for you? And I know you're inside of Salesforce. How is an integration going? Are you liking what you're doing? What are you doing? Um, I am still leading Slack and um, I actually just I just recorded a video for the team back home because I'm not going to be able to join this this town hall. And at one of the first dinners I got to when I arrived in Davos, someone asked, like, what's your reasons for optimism? Because obviously there's a lot of tough things going on in the world. And this is a narrow view. I, I'm, as a human, optimistic for many more things. But um, at Slack, I'm optimistic about the kind of the amount of technological infrastructure we've laid over the course of many years, the features. We have over 200,000 customers. we have I don't think we've nailed it yet, but we've got better at, at the pitch and trying to help new customers get on board. And uh, all of that feels like it's a moment to like, of culmination where the next round of innovations are going to have a lot more impact and reach a lot more people more quickly. So that's, that's what's next for me. CEOs around the globe were gassing up their jets for Davos. The crypto, NFT, and Web3 world was just wrapping up. The first ever VCon, that's a four-day conference hosted by Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary V has his own NFT collection. He calls it uh, V Friends, and he predicted the very crash that we're currently seeing in the industry. I had a chance to sit down with the serial entrepreneur and talk all things Web3.0. Web 3.0 captures a category of new things going on for everybody watching. Web 2 is what captured social media. Before we called them social media sites, when we were first meeting, we called them Web 2.0 sites. It was 2009 Facebook. when That's we right. first met. Yeah. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they were called Web 2 sites because it was like the web is growing up. This is Web 3, which is kind of interesting because the blockchain is not the internet, but we're calling it Web 3. Um, and what Web3 is, it's capturing the blockchain, it's capturing this concept called the metaverse, which is Oculus and things of that nature where you live in virtual reality. People have seen Ready Player One, that movie. It's capturing that. In practical terms, what it is is owning something digitally. And it's most simplistic thing, you own something digitally. Now the reason people struggle with that is you can't own anything digitally on the internet. People can go and right click and save an image and then I have it on my phone and you think you own it but you don't own it. Whereas in Web3, the blockchain allows you to own it. That's why Bitcoin was a big thing. You actually own those Bitcoins. NFTs, you own these digital pictures and art. The part that people still don't get yet in 101 land is you can have a contract attached to that art that makes you do something no different than the contract behind your credit card. For everybody who's really struggling, go talk to your grandparents. It'll take you two seconds. If you're 57 watching this, 32, go talk to your grandparents if you're lucky enough to have them and ask them how everybody felt about the credit card in the 70s okay. when it was first introduced. Every single guy, 25 to 99 years old, when they first heard about the credit card in 1972, said, I'm never Scam. doing that. I got cash. I'll never give up cash. There's not a person on earth that walks around with cash now. And so that's exactly what's going to How much happen. you got on you? I have. You have cash? I do have a little bit. I have $102. Thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. That's nice of you, Gary. Happy Very to nice. do it. I'm going to read you a quote. Please. And I don't know if you recognize it. It's from November of 21. So not that long ago, but it feels like light years ago. An NFT winter is coming, a crash driven by short-term greed, supply and demand issues. Who said that? Me. You. 
I also said, Is that what we're in right now? I also, on the record, wish you went back a little further because I also said it in August and I said it in July and I said it in May. I saw this coming. That is absolutely potentially what we're in. It's just starting. There's a correction. There was a correction in January. There's a correction in other times. So we need more sustained time for Ethereum to stay at this price, for the best projects to stay at this price. The, but my hope is that's what we're in. So everybody who's watching, the prices went crazy. You probably heard at this point, like this NFT is worth a million dollars, a half a million dollars. You thought it was crazy. And in reality, you were right. It was crazy. It was as crazy as internet stocks in the late 90s being worth $400 billion for pets.com. The internet was coming. It was gonna change the world. The valuations on Wall Street were overblown. The valuations on NFTs in this first year are overblown because people get overexcited. Gold rush, short term, quick cash. But the fundamentals are real and that's why people are confused. The macro is super right. NFTs are here forever. The micro was wrong, that's why we're correcting. I'm sure you saw the New York Times piece this week. Where are those celebrities that were hawking crypto and NFTs in the crypto bowl? And Matt Damon has been the face of that uh, for his commercial. Um, Should there be accountability? Should there be more warnings in this industry? A, I think this, go get the celebrities thing that the mainstream media is attracted to in this moment is very lazy because they were writing those same articles as well. I think celebrities are easy to pick on given their status and I also think that's understandable. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. I do think there should be. You know, I don't, I, I've been incredibly at the forefront of this movement. The reason I'm not getting murdered is because I was overly aggressively on quotes like that consistently. I think for celebrities, they have to be careful to who, what they endorse, what they support, but I think it's ludicrous for people to blame them on the price. Why are we not blaming CNBC and Yahoo Finance and everybody else for stock prices being down? Celebrities did not invade Ukraine. And uh, you know, inflation was not celebrities. And so the correction of the global economy has also been a direct impact on the crypto economy. And so we have to be thoughtful when we point fingers. But you just said the magic word, which is inflation, and crypto was supposed to be a hedge against it. It didn't happen because the group of people that were to hedge against it were the original OGs and they were right. The problem is the masses are now in it. And so the people that own Bitcoin and Ethereum and Friends and World of Women are buying it the same way they think about real estate and Wall Street. And when things go down and they're playing with money they can't afford to lose, they panic and they sell and that's why markets go down. What do you make of the moment that NFTs have collapsed, meanwhile people are paying $143 million for a Mercedes, $195 million for an Andy Warhol, a $922 million art collection just sold last week at Sotheby's, and they did two and a half billion in the last three weeks. Collectibles you can feel, touch, hang on your wall and drive are bulletproof. They're not bulletproof. They are having a good moment. You know what else is having a good moment? NFTs. Yes, the NFT market is down. More people bought NFTs this week than the entire months a year ago. We're coming from a stratosphere number of complete ridiculousness. Yesterday, many, hundreds, thousands of NFTs were sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, yesterday. This is cliche social media, mainstream media, all reflection of human beings. Human beings get excited about very basic headlines with very little data below them. (laughs) Listen, you've lived this life, you've been in a lot of places through your career. Everybody reads one headline, NFTs are down. Yes, they're down from completely non-sustainable gold rush numbers of January. They're also so up from a year ago today, it's not even close. And so this is what always happens. I was there when everybody wrote articles and said the internet was a fad when March 2000 happened and everything collapsed. News alert, Yahoo, the internet wasn't a fad. And NFTs will not be a fad and I will be historically correct about that. Let's get to the positive which is your NFT, that's how you get in That was the positive. (laughs) Yes, from my my perspective. Real quick, I want everybody to hear this. That was the positive. When markets get out of hysteria and correct, that's when the good stuff starts. You get rid of the individuals who are there for, this is in real estate, this is in sports car collecting, this is in Wall Street, this is everywhere. Once you get the people in that actually believe in get rich quick, it gets good. 
I don't know if you have to beat that on Yahoo, but please beep it. It gets good. And so I think this is the good part. I'm happy. I've been anxious for the last 15 months, which is why I've made so much of that content. I'm like, can we just get past the part where everyone thinks they're gonna be a millionaire in an hour? And I'm really happy we're in this spot. Securities and Exchange Commission regulators have proposed new disclosure and naming requirements for ESG or environmental, social, and governance funds this week. The commission voted Wednesday on the proposals aimed at giving investors more information about those ETFs as well as require that at least 80% of their holdings adhere to those labels. Joining us now to help break down these changes is Vetify's head of research, Todd Rosenbluth. Um, Vetify, by the way, the artist formerly known as ETF Trends, by the way, for those who are watch the ETF space. Todd, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Man, there's so much confusion about this topic, isn't there? Um, for investors of all stripes, you know, how does this ETF differ from that ETF? What does ESG mean? What definition is this one using versus that one? How should people be thinking about this? Well, the beauty of the ETF structure is you can look inside of the portfolio and understand what you're getting understand what it owns and also understand what it doesn't own in relation to a broader index. And as you mentioned, we at Vetify uh, are focusing on this trend about ESG and making sure investors have the tools they need to understand this because the name, which is what the SEC is focusing on, doesn't tell you the whole story. The underlying holdings do. You have to dig inside the portfolio and understand the rules and understand what is and is not inside various ESG products. And do this, does this new SEC ruling about having more rules around these disclosures, is that going to help? Well, it can't hurt right now because there's a lot of confusion going on in the industry. People don't fully understand the environmental, social, and governance practices. Many people think of ESG as just the environmental, that E pillar. And so I, I know we're going to get into it a bit about Tesla and whether it is or is not included. But people think of Tesla as an environmentally friendly company, but it isn't necessarily, according to some of the index providers, strong on that social or governance practice. So we've actually, when we were talking with advisors this week uh, at Vetify, we heard that people are looking to have a cleaner part of their portfolio. They think of ESG as being a way to solve that problem. In fact, it's only solving part of that problem. Well, and here's a conundrum I think that I think about. Um, energy, the best performing sector of the year, up something like 45, 50%. Not a lot of those names are ESG friendly. I recognize I'm, fo I'm focusing on the E, but um, if a, an investor wants to be invested in the energy sector, what kinds of companies or exposure through ETFs would they be able to get? Well, you're right. So it matters what kind of ETF we're talking about. So an ETF like EFIV, which is the Spider S&P ESG ETF, uh, or EF, uh, or sorry, SNPE, which is a DWS X Tracker product that's tracking the same index. It has companies uh, within the energy sector. It's intended to be broadly diversified across all of the sectors. So you can look at some of those environmentally, socially strong or governance companies that fit into that portfolio and you'd be able to understand what you have and what you don't have. If you're looking to exclude energy, there are ETFs that, that are focused on that, that, that are fossil fuel reserve free. Uh, State Street also has one of those products. But the ESG lineup tends to have some exposure to energy companies if they're broad in nature. And that's in part of what the appeal has been. These ETFs tend to track the broader market because they're exposed to all the sectors within the broader market. I mean, at the same time, you can kind of see Musk's point, right? When he's looking at these criteria and whether they are evenly applied. I think that's sort of what he and probably some investors struggle with. I mean, if you look at any company, and this is not to say that the labor practices at Tesla are great. I'm not going to weigh in on that. But you can probably look at any company and find so, no company is going to be perfect on ESG. It's going to be very difficult to find that. So I just wonder how investors are thinking about this as they look at all this stuff, or are they just sort of taking the definitions and what goes into them at face value? So I think it matters how much your priorities are for ESG. So there are two ETFs or two very popular ETFs from iShares that track MSCI benchmarks. ESGU is one of those, and then USXF is the second one. 
USXF is more concentrated in companies that are the relative superstars within the ESG uh, area, as opposed to ESGU, which gives you some exposure uh, to the companies that are relatively okay within the ESG. And it's going to kick out companies that are the worst uh, offenders within the ESG realm within each of their respective parts of the marketplace. So you have to make sure you understand what you're getting. We're showing USXF on the screen here. It doesn't own Apple. Uh, yeah. So it's not just Tesla that's being excluded from some of these index-based ESG ETFs. So whether or not that's a good or bad thing matters to the end investor. They need to make an informed decision. And that's something that when we wrote about this earlier this week on Vetify's platform, we compared USXF and ESGU. And finally, Todd, I want to ask how these funds are doing in terms of flows, right? Uh, they seem to have really caught on over the past few years. Certainly, there are the big houses like BlackRock that are, are really pushing this stuff. Is there uptake among investors? So it's coming off of a very small base. We continue to see uh, that there's been demand globally for ESG products. It has slowed a bit this year. It's a down market, so we haven't seen investor enthusiasm for putting new money to work. Some of the assets that we're, asset growth that we're showing on the screen here is the result of the market strength that we saw in 2021. But thus far in 2022, because the stock market has been down, the average ESG ETF has been down, people are a little bit more hesitant to put as much new money to work. We're seeing investors focus on the broader core products than the more ESG-oriented ETFs. Well, we got to leave it there, but always appreciate your insights.